Hello, and thank you for joining Global Design Talk by Btrax. Uh, today, I'm really excited to be talking with my friend, uh, Jen Wu uh, from Cookhouse, but also I, you've done a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And so obviously this YouTube channel is about global design, but that has a lot of different connotations. And so today we'll be taking a view from a different angle than maybe what we're used to, and we'll jump right into that. But first of all, Jen, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, let's see, I'm, uh, I'm by training, I'm a statistician and an operations researcher. I also studied marketing and entertainment media technology in college. Um, and then uh, I jumped right into my career at Warner Music Group where I worked in micro research, which slightly shifted when I moved to Silicon Valley and worked in tech research and um, more like uh, syndicated research. And then toward the last five years, I've been working more on uh, design for the future as in speculative futures, um, moving more and more toward things like scenario planning and futures thinking. So I'm the one that sets up the research that provides the background and foundation for speculative futures and futures thinking projects. Um, so that's more in line with like innovation research and, and futures research. Uh, so that's what I've been working on the last uh, five years or so. Mm -hmm. But for the last 12 years, so 14 years, I've been working on the side project, which was very time intensive, but still another project called Cookhouse, which was a brick and mortar in San Francisco, which was open 2011 to 2022. Um, so we closed the brick and mortar in 2022. Um, and transition to online only. And that was an events business, so it was in the hospitality realm. Very different, but I actually really enjoyed the, the, the mix of physical manual labor and then also a lot of just being in the spreadsheets and thinking about ideas and you know having meetings with different kinds of people um, from both sides. So it was a really fun time, um, a lot of work though. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's, all I have to say for my careers, so I can't right. what we're here to talk about. And they're like, I'm, I'm thinking through what you just talked about and the thread or the connection of like starting here to here to here, like to cookhouse <laughs> from uh, the research standpoint is, is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. How did you decide to go from being kind of market research, doing planning out research projects to stepping up and designing and creating this cookhouse space? Um, that's a great question. It's hard to remember because it's so long ago. <laughs> Basically, at the time I was working uh, in syndicated research and I was traveling a lot. I was um, traveling, I want to say like 50% of the time and uh, between Seattle and Europe and sometimes Asia um, and all over the US. And I was doing speaking engagements and presenting at conferences and meeting with clients. And being on the road was really exhausting. Um, I then wanted to make my roots here, you know what I mean? I spent about two years doing a lot of traveling, but I made a lot of new friends, but then I realized I couldn't quite keep up. I couldn't like keep in touch with them as well. I, could, I didn't really get to hang out with them on a regular basis. So even though I loved hanging out with them, I was I was saying like, oh, I'll be gone that week, I'll be gone this week, etc. I think this is kind of a common thread for many young professionals who travel a lot. So I really wanted to, you know, make some roots here. <laughs> so I decided after um, the startup was sold to an acquiring company that I was going to make my own way and, and find a way to sort of um, meet more people in the local area in different industries. And at the time, I wasn't sure I wanted to continue market research, but opportunities kept popping up and, you know, through all the connections I had, and they just said, like, would you like to work on this and that and everything? And it kind of turned from market research into um, more like innovation research. So the idea kind of came from wanting a different kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, so staring at the spreadsheet all day and just, you know, talking on the phone and <laughs> meeting with clients and personals while traveling. Um, but I kept doing it because it was really rewarding to be able to use my physical body and work um, as opposed to just sitting on the laptop and then vice versa. You know, when I came back to work at my laptop, I really appreciated that a lot more. So it fed, fed the two sides of my brain, you might want to say. So you wanted to connect with more people. And so you started a brick and mortar business. 
where people could come to. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, in fact. That's all right. <laughs> and it sounds very San Francisco in a Definitely. lot of ways to just come up with an idea based off of a problem you're having and just go towards it. Like not really even having a background in that space. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like I, I see that a lot here where people are, I would say brave enough, I guess, to make the jump to, to build something. Like, thank you. Right? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's the solid 12 years uh, of your life that yeah. you put into it. it was a, and by the way, it was a great space. I, I, I was a frequenter of the cookhouse space. And so we're going to pivot now a little bit into spaces, right? So now where are you in this journey? Ah, great question also. Um, I, I, I would best describe myself as a student right now. So I'm not an expert in anything with regards to what I'm working on or what I want to move into. But then again, I think there are a few people that are, and I think I might have a unique perspective when it comes to it. So um, when Cookhouse was winding down its physical operations, my colleagues and I were trying to figure out what we wanted to do next, or if we just wanted to shut it down, which would have been perfectly fine. Because I warned them that the events business might get a little funky for a little while, just given that it was in the, still in the middle of COVID, and we're still getting outbreaks of like this or that variant. So I was thinking, like, first of all, is this an industry that I still want to be in in 10 years. I don't know. I'm a little physically exhausted for the last 12 years. Yeah. Um, and I loved it, but you know, it might have been for a time in the same way that you know a lot of chefs kind of physically burn out. A lot of that you know, physical labor, labor can only kind of go for a while before your body starts breaking down in certain ways. So um, I was thinking I'd love to, I, I was asked to consult with a few different businesses, event venues mostly, that were starting their own business and or in the middle of it, but needed a lot of help in terms of like, how do we process this? And how do we make this more of an operations thing? Mm -hmm. As opposed to just kind of like randomly putting out fires, how do we um, systematize this? So it was great that they were thinking this way and they actually had the time to do it. So I, they asked me to come in and just kind of talk, me through, talk them through how I did it. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really think that we had a lot of knowledge um, about this. <laughs> I just thought we just did what we had to. Yeah. And then I realized a lot of design went into it, but I didn't really see it as that. I just saw it as solving a problem and hopefully not solving it just once, just you know, putting a process in place that you can kind of repetitively use. Yeah. And it'd be a lot better for training new people to come into the company to teach them new skills, but also make the process smoother to help clients with the process of booking and and actually having an event, which can be a little confusing if you're stepping into a new business model for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, Cookhouse was not a hotel, it wasn't a restaurant, yep. it wasn't even a banquet hall. <laughs> it was kind of this weird hybrid that allowed people to kind of have whatever creative vision they had for an event or a gathering come true. So we wanted to be sort of like a blank slate and make space for them to do that. But we were, we were like not really we're making systems out of everything, but we weren't really um, aware that we were doing that until we were asked to teach other people to do it. So then um, decided to put all our materials and um, uh, written stuff, like spreadsheets, uh, written's not the right word, but digitize things, <laughs> assets, you could say, into uh, an online course and just put it online. And in some ways, it's not really a course. It's more like a, more like just a, bank of information. It's like a master class. <laughs> it's sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can just kind of jump around and work from it. So kind of it's kind of meant to be just a just a reference point for anybody that's starting a venue or or learning how to run one. God. Yeah. But from there also we're yeah. kind of interested <laughs> in in um what uh we could it's Cookhouse's main function was to serve as a as a hub for social connection. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that there was a huge hunger for it. So um, one of the ideas that we thought about was to start a research company in social health mm -hmm. and social wellness, whatever you might call it. It's also called social adaptability, and yep. social resilience, and social wellness, and social fitness, and whatever new buzzword there is um, by the time you're watching this YouTube video. So um, we were really interested in that because a lot of times when people talk to us about how much they enjoyed the experience at Cookhouse. It wasn't about, you know, like using nice equipment and mm -hmm. um, sitting at a big table. It was much more about, you know, thank you for making a space for us to meet this person or to, you know, celebrate this milestone mm -hmm. for our, you know, our relationship or 
our uh, business or our life, you know, in terms of births and that kind of thing. So uh, it was really rewarding in that way, and we realized there's more of a need for that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where Cook has evolved, yeah, has evolved to this point in time. Uh, and I feel like it's 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 continually finding its feet in renewal. And you're doing a lot of research now on what that social wellness, social connection space looks like, mm -hmm. right? And, and what are you finding in terms of like, not only what the research has shown, but how people are designing these spaces? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's just less of the spaces. That's what I'm finding a lot of. Yeah. Um, and the design of it is a little hostile to social connection. Not, mm -hmm. not for every, I'm, I'm making up some broad strokes here. <laughs> like across the world, there's it, it's really difficult to run small businesses and especially public facing businesses right. um, with a, the economic climate the way it is and living costs going up and younger people um, not being able to afford as much you know, in terms of um, you know leisure expenses. Mm -hmm. It just seems like there's less time and space to gather. Um, even the spaces that we have have fewer hours or maybe um, there are fewer of them where they're less accessible or they're less financially accessible and um, they might be less friendly, they might require membership fees or high membership fees, might require that you be of a certain class or group, in-group political affiliation, that kind of thing. I'm not saying there aren't like very welcoming and inclusive societies and communities and spaces where you can actually gather and meet new people. But um, the number of really, truly casual, conversational, meet your neighbor kind of people, uh, places rather, mm -hmm. has, has been a little bit on the decline um, and more commercialized. So not really for the, the purpose of uh, conversing and meeting new people, but for just deepening the connections that we have. And that was one of the regrets I had with Cookhouse, was uh, not, maybe not regret, but attention. Yeah. That whenever somebody said, oh, I love how you foster community here, or this is so good for the community. And I would think to myself, that's so strange because what do you mean by community? And you know, if I dug a little further, they'd say something like, well, you know, San Francisco or the Bay Area or maybe this, the neighborhood. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, we're not meeting people from the neighborhood. Like we're, we're meeting you know, the people you invited, which yeah. is great. You know, I'm, I'm glad you have this place to deepen the bonds that you want to. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, you know, it, it, we're talking about bonding and not bridging. Bonding versus bridging is not my concept, by the way, it, it's kind of both. Okay. <laughs> but bonding is more deepening the social con connections that you already have, and yep. bridging is um, making new connections from a wider range of people, right. um, potentially not from your maybe academic background or your uh, social economic class mm -hmm. or uh, your race or your language or um, even your local community. And those are the kinds of things that really create a lot of opportunities for idea exchange mm -hmm. and even for a career or for just, you know, like in, in general, broadening your worldview. And with the loss of that, we've lost a lot of social trust. and. There's not as much opportunity for it when we say like um, there aren't going to be as many places for you to just sit and gather and people. Um, and there's there's less I think even among the young generation that has never seen a lot of these places. And at the same time, one has to choose between like coffee shops and and bars, mm -hmm. uh, which are which is less and less you know um, how do you say attractive mm -hmm. <laughs> to a more sober generation. Well, in a lot of these spaces you're talking to about, I realize that there needs to be a business model associated, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's this balance. Right? You're trying to grow, you're trying to create these bonding opportunities mm -hmm. and, and bridge community and like really connect with people that are local. And, and actually, like it, I immediately kind of go to community centers mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, or YMCAs in different places that maybe are a little bit more affordable and have their purpose. but when you started explaining that, it immediately brought my mind to, um, you, you know, Blue Zones. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, you know, Netflix has another documentary on the Blue Zones. Oh, cool. Um, but the first episode is about Okinawa. Ah. And one of the reasons that they kind of showcase as, um, I would say, long, for their longevity mm -hmm. is that kind of community connection, neighborhood connection. And, and 
specifically around this idea of Moai, mm -hmm. which is when like people get together, like maybe you know ten people, and each month they get together, they all give the same amount of money every, every month, and then one person out of that group gets it for that month. Oh, cool! And so you know, like you know, but that the financial piece of it is a benefit, but the the real value is connecting with whether it's you know your friends it could be your classmates it could be people you work with or your family mm -hmm. uh, and that actually that, that my, my thread of thoughts is basically from there I go to this idea of third spaces mm -hmm. third places where um, I'm fascinated by the idea of creating experiences for those who who are in need, whether it's the dementia population, right? Or and and there's a Japanese cafe, yeah. right? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know you've been researching this. You actually wrote a blog post about oh, yeah. kind of <laughs> what, where in the world these kinds of third places, third spaces are being kind of created. Yeah, and so many good ideas there. I mean, the one that you referenced in Okinawa is just one of many, like very like low investment needed, just a little bit of organization and some definition of what's gonna go on for you to just, you know, gather a bunch of people and create something kind of fun and you know, emphasizes that interdependability that we all have that love to shove down in America. Um, but yeah, in third places there's just um, a need for a lot more casual interaction and I'm so sorry. Can you remind me of the question? I, I yeah, no. thread and then I forgot. Yeah. So in terms of third places, you know, there are oh, yeah, cafes, the restaurant. restaurants, right. there are experienced villages yeah. that are being designed. And I want to, I want to go back to kind of, you know, the theme designed to support somebody, a population in need. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on kind of like, First of all, you can tell everybody where this is happening, oh, yeah. why it's happening, what do you see as the successful parts mm -hmm. or the reasons why these, uh, these activations or experiences, communities are successful? Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. So um, one, there's so many huge benefits to them. Um, mm -hmm. And one of them, the, the restaurant mistaken orders is the one that you referenced. Yes. And, Oh, every time I send this video to my friends, they say, oh, just, just fall. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, it, the, the servers in this restaurant all have dementia, so they have varying levels of memory loss mm -hmm. and disorientation. And of course, there's a lot of people that help them. The cooks don't have dementia, so the, the food is always good. Um, you know, this, the, the, the restaurant um, uh, guests come in knowing exactly you know, what they're getting and that they might get their orders wrong. And, but at the end of the day, there's so much levity around that. They know what they're getting. They understand that the servers, you know, might forget something, and it's totally fine. Yeah. Um, at, you know, they they all have a good time. They get paid for the work. It's so good to feel needed, yeah. especially if you're in a population that may not experience any interaction with the public mm -hmm. for your own safety, um, formed by necessity, um, and maybe only interact with the same people every day. Maybe your caretaker maybe your family, maybe a few friends, but you know, as, as we enter older age and we have um, fewer and fewer friends and fewer and fewer family to take care of us, mm -hmm. you know, we miss those kind of like uh, interactions with people in public. And right. so there's another um, village, it's called Dementia Village in Norway. Um, and they're built specifically for the purpose of having these third places like pubs and a store and a cafe and a hairdresser so that the patients can actually go there. But the important part is that members of the public can actually come in. Mm -hmm. So they can interact with them. Maybe they're volunteers, but maybe they're just members of the public. So it feels like they're part of regular life mm -hmm. and that there's spontaneity and there's serendipity and you can have an interesting conversation with somebody that you would never have before and you would probably have a new idea or um, you know that, that kind of thing. Yeah, and there's there's great examples of um, these. They're, they've been happening forever, of course, but right. I think we just need more creativity around it now. Yeah. So, for example, in China, bookstore cafes are a thing. In Japan, an uh, architect named Jorge Amazon created a, like a Tomosake brewery that was kind of run down mm -hmm. in a residential part of Japan. He created more of a public space where concerts could be held and, and could be a gathering spot during the day. Um, there's 
lots of other examples of revitalizing areas just to get like some spaces activated so people could come in and feel like there's place capital there mm -hmm. and allow them to build some social capital there whether or not whether it's building or bridging mm -hmm. and there's more and more examples that could create um, inspiration for new third spaces to evolve yeah. but I think a huge part of that evolution could be that the let's say I don't want to call them event organizers because that sounds like it's very formal they have to have a set event or something but like a casual gathering organizer i want there to be more opportunities for them mm -hmm. to let's say do something in a space that's underutilized or maybe just utilize part of the day yeah. and i realize that there are you know economic realities to this and i think we're working with a really difficult economic climate mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily incentivize us to open up for public space yeah. you know like for me, it was licensing requirements and also the fact I'm an introvert. I don't like to just like <laughs> allow anybody any amount of time with me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, in general, like there's a lot of barriers to it. But yeah. I think there's so many interesting spaces and in, like um, like fields and diverse um, design of like interiors and exteriors and parks and like areas of parks and little like conclaves that you know it. it these third spaces are, are really possible wherever. And mm -hmm. I think that we really could benefit from a diverse array of them. Yeah. And the more of them we have, the better I think for our social fabric. So um, it's really great to see the inspiration from around the world and trade ideas from say like Amsterdam yeah. uh, to China and Taiwan to Australia, um, Thailand, and then um, coming back to the States. Cause we're all different societies, but we all have the same need for connectedness and yeah. to meet people slightly different from our like-minded sort. I love it. I love it. That was that was some really great insights on like what honestly what we need and how to design kind of these connected experiences across the globe. Um, I think we're actually out of time. Oh wow! Which I know is like the perfect bam. Uh, so, but we could probably keep going for another 20, 30 minutes just totally. talking about how to create <laughs> these amazing spaces, how to build connection. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, I just want to be cognizant of <laughs> our time and just say, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation with Jen Wu. Uh, please look her up if you want to. She's been writing about third places. And um, if you liked uh, this episode, please subscribe. Please, uh, you know. Um, for uh, notifications.